Good afternoon. Welcome to CMC Markets Non-Farm Payrolls webinar on Friday the 5th of April with me, Michael Hewson, and I will be spending the next half an hour or so basically walking you through the latest US employment report. Before we get started, a little bit of um, housekeeping. Do a risk warning first and foremost. Um, basically, any I will I will not be giving trading advice, but what I will be doing is obviously highlighting some key levels, looking at the prospects for um, a good number, a bad number, a neutral number, what and what the directional impact might well be of the numbers when they're released. Obviously, we also not only have the U.S. employment report today, we also have the Canada jobs report as well so got quite a bit to get through but obviously questions are welcome i will try and answer your questions as fully as i can obviously stopping short of telling you where to buy or sell i cannot do that nor would i do that anyway even if you ask me so don't even try um, nonetheless um, once we get the risk warnings out of the way um, we can we can get started. So I'll just get rid of that, get rid of that. And now we can have a look at my screen. So basically I think expectations around this month's payrolls are not, I wouldn't say they're as high as they were in the February number. And I think there's a big, big reason for that. We posted a very poor number in February, came in at 20,000, missed by a country mile. Now, there could be a number of factors behind that because the ADP number, the equivalent ADP employment report, which came out two days before that, was actually a fairly decent number. So the big question is, why would why would, why would, we, why would we get a weak February number? Well, there could be any number of factors behind that. There could be the fact that we had a US government shutdown um, and that could have skewed the numbers. It could mean that we get a significant upward adjustment to the February numbers when the March numbers are, are are reported in 14 minutes time. Also, what we could get is a significant um, a significant uplift in the March numbers. So, at the moment, the disappointing number coming as it did against the 311,000 new jobs that we saw in January is not too much of a concern. There could be another factor as well behind the disappointing number. It could just be that the US labour market is getting tight and that basically while the vacancies are there, there aren't enough people to actually fill them. And that's probably why the jobs figure was so low. What was encouraging was that the wages numbers came in at 3.4%, which is a decade high. It's the highest level since the financial crisis. And that would support the view that the US labour market is tightening up and that employers are having to pay their staff more to not only keep them, but also attract new staff. What does that mean for the dollar? Well, to be quite honest, not that much now, because since the last payrolls report, the Federal Reserve um, has come out and changed its guidance quite significantly from where it was at the end of last year. In fact, it's actually been quite notable at how quickly the Fed has turned around its forward guidance. Because if you think about where we were at the beginning of last year, markets were pricing in up to three rate rises this year. If we look at the performance of the dollar index over the course of the last six months, and you can see it on the chart in front of you, it hasn't really gone anywhere. It's traded between 95 and 98, which is the equivalent of euro dollar trading between 112 and 115, 116. So it's been pretty uninteresting all round. And I think that that more than anything else is likely to really, I think, dictate what the dollar does today, because the change of guidance that we saw from the Fed, where, but whereby we are now not expecting any rate rises this year, and we've seen a significant downgrade to the growth forecast, means that even if we get a very good US number, a very good payrolls number, the dollar upside is likely to be fairly limited. If we look at this dollar index chart here, we can see 
9680, 9680, three levels of resistance all the way through here. Now that level is important because what it does is it equates to a low in euro dollar of around about 11180. So if we look at euro dollar um, on a daily chart here, this is a daily chart, um, I've drawn a slight trend line through here, it's slightly skewy, I might have to redraw that a little bit. But what it's basically telling us, particularly through these lows here, is is a very solid area of support between 11180 and 112. And we're roughly, we're, we're just above that now. So if we get a good payrolls number in excess of 200,000, we could see euro dollar push a little bit lower. But it's going to take something quite substantial to push it below this 11180 level. It's, it's important for a number of reasons. First and foremost, it's important because it's the lows of the last uh, few weeks. But it's also important because it's a 61.8 Fibonacci retracement of the entire up move from the lows at 103.40 all the way back in 2017, end of 2016, to the peaks at the beginning of 2018. So it's important not to underestimate how important this 111.80 level is. So if we get a move down there, we'd really have to see a either a significant push up in wages to 3.5 or 3.6 percent and even then you'd have to ask yourself the question as to whether or not that is likely to cause the Fed to hike this year um, and my view is it wouldn't because if you actually look, look at what US Treasury yields are doing they're potentially pricing in a the potential for a little bit of a rate cut so I think you know you have to you have to temper your expectations when it comes to the likelihood of what may or may not happen with respect to US rates into 2019. And you've also got to temper it into the fact that President Trump has always made it quite clear, has already made it quite clear that he wants rates to go lower from their current levels. His new Fed appointment or nominee, Stephen Moore, has already suggested that there should be a 50 basis point rate cut from the Federal Reserve. Now, that's not going to happen. But the point is that the direction of travel for U.S. rates appears to have topped out. That's borne out by the fact that U.S. Treasury yields since non-farm payrolls a month ago have dropped quite substantially. We can see that on this chart here. So this is the March payrolls report um, here, which was around about the 8th of March. And we got uh, we got that uh, we got that disappointing jobs number since then yields have come down quite substantially now we have seen a bit of a rebound and a good and a good payrolls report could see yields push up and um, the bonds sell off but ultimately the direction of travel for us yields remains towards the downside now so that's euro dollar 111.80 on the downside a poor number could see us push back up to these series of highs through here so we're looking over the last four hours four, on a four-hour chart. We've got a series of highs through 112.40 or 112.50. And we could even see it push up towards around about 113. But I'm not really expecting a number that's going to move it significantly out of its current range. Now, I'm being asked about the cable. Very good question. And it's no less valid. But obviously, there is an awful lot of political risk around the cable. But again, it's a similar sort of story when it comes to the support levels. We can look at the moving averages here. We've got the 200 day moving average. We've got a series of lows through 129.60. So while we're above 129.60, cable is very much a buy the dip in the same way that Euro dollar is a buy the dip while it's above 111.80 um, for a move back towards um, either 113 in the Euro dollar's case or around about 130, 170, 132 in cable's case. If you look at the way the cable's performed, thus far this year. It's been a fairly steady range, albeit it's moved around quite a lot intraday. But ultimately what it's telling us is that traders are reluctant to push it aggressively lower um, simply because they're not too sure whether or not we'll get a, a an extension to Article 50 next Friday. The likelihood is we probably will. Um, whether Theresa May has already asked for, ex for an extension to June 30th 
simply, I think she just copied and pasted her last letter to the EU Commission asking for the extension to the 30th of June, working on the basis of at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again, so she's going to do that. I don't think the EU will give her to the 30th of June, I think they will give her a much longer ex extension and it will be contingent on uh, the UK participating in European parliamentary elections on May the 22nd or May the 23rd or whenever they are. So at the moment, while a no deal Brexit is the default legal position, I think the European Union will do all it can to avoid that p playing out because if they don't, they'll be as good as throwing Ireland underneath the bus. Um, because they will be adversely affected quite significantly by a no-deal Brexit, as will France, even though Emmanuel Macron is talking tough. He's already got problems with the Gilets jaunes protesters. I hardly likely think he's going to want any more. Now, I'm being asked, if is Trump interfering with the Fed's independence? Absolutely he is. He's trying to influence what the Fed does. And I think one part of the reason why you saw um, the Fed call a halt was, I think, part and parcel of that. But I also think the makeup of the FOMC has changed slightly and it's become more dovish anyway. And I think the fact that China's slowing down, the economic data that we've seen out of Germany thus far has been absolutely abysmal. I think it's going to be much more difficult for the Fed to raise rates when no one else is. The ECB is not going to be raising rates anytime soon. The Bank of England probably won't. Um, and the Bank of Japan definitely won't. So I think the last thing that I think the, uh, the, the US wants is a stronger dollar. Rates are already very, very high relative to the rest of the world. And I think that should be enough. And there is evidence that, that the higher rates are affecting the housing market in the US. If you look at home sales, they have been disappointing. So I think calling rates to be where they are. I think the Fed's finished its rate hiking cycle. The big question now is when will the Fed ease again? And I think that could be at the beginning of next year. It could come as soon as December this year, but much will depend on the data. And at the moment, the data, while it's slowing down, it's not falling off a cliff. So looking at the cable 129.60, if we get a strong payrolls number, a strong wages number, we could see the dollar move higher towards just below 130, but there's good support down there. If we look at um, if we look at uh, the dollar yen, it's a similar sort of story, a strong dollar move could see us move up towards the top end of the range that we've seen over the course of the past few over the past few weeks, which is 112. It's really struggled to get much above 112, and I think it will continue to struggle to get much above 112 on dollar yen. Let's have a quick look at the Dow before we get started, because I did get asked about that. Um, and we can see here, it's pretty, actually, let's look at the S&P, because we've broken above these highs here. Um, haven't got much in the way of lines on that. I don't tend to look at the Dow as much as I look at the S&P. And if we look at the S&P, we've just posted a golden cross on the daily charts. It's where the 50-day moving averages crosses above the 200-day. It's usually fairly bullish. What we need to see is a move above 2,900. The all-time highs are all the way back here in October. The air is looking a little bit thin, but again, it's the direction of travel. You don't sell into an uptrend. You look to buy the dips. And that is the way that I always work on the basis of. Um, you but you basically trade in the direction of the overall trend. The overall trend is higher. And as such, um, we could well retest the 2900 level. I would be surprised if we move above it today, ahead of the weekend. I think it's likely that we've probably seen the highs in the short term, we may try for a little bit of a push higher, but if we look at a weekly chart, we can see that we are looking a little bit stretched at this point in time. And also if we look at, say for example, the FTSE 100 as a case in point, we are now approaching some very key resistance levels on a lot of the major indices. We can see it on the FTSE 100, draw a trend line through the peaks from last year, currently comes in around about I would suggest 74.50, um, 74, yeah, around about 74.50. So we could see a move up there, particularly if the pound drops against the dollar. And a similar sort of story when we look at the DAX. 12,000, a little bit of a top there. But if you go slightly above that here, you can see we're also got a significant area of trend line resistance going forward. But certainly I think um, 
the direction of travel still remains by the dip and that's borne out by the fact the Eurostox 50 has just posted a golden cross as well. 50 day moving average is pointing upwards really solid support now at 32.81 in the Eurostox 50 so despite all the negative data and um, the poor growth outlook equity markets still look fairly buoyant and I suppose in Europe that's not too surprising because if you've got German 10-year yield, yields yielding nothing then where are you going to put your money in Europe if you can't put them in bonds you're going to put them in equities because generally you'll find that as long as central banks keep monetary policy loose then you should um, get good demand for equities. Okay, so here we go. Looking for 180,000 non-farm payrolls, 1,000 in Canada jobs, and wages 3.4. And here we go. 196,000 for US payrolls, wages a bit lower, so that's a weaker dollar number. Um, so that's probably going to see the dollar sell off a little bit. Euro dollar go up, cable go up. Um, Canadian jobs report was a negative number which is a little bit of a surprise. Um, the revision for February was only a modest one. It's gone up from 20 to 33,000. So it's a poor Canada jobs report, and it's not a particularly... Uh, it's, it's a good headline number on the non-farms, but it's disappointing on the wages. So we've got a little bit of a mixed report for the US. Slightly dollar negative, but not massively so. Wages are still fairly decent. They're still well above inflation. But, but but obviously the decline in wages is a little bit disappointing. So 3.2 average earnings, slightly missing expectations. There's nothing in that report that is going to move the dollar out of its range. Let's have a look at the effects on dollar CAD and any potential move here. It's a weak Canadian jobs report with a negative number. That is likely to see the dollar move higher and against the Canadian dollar and it has and I think we could well see a move back up towards those peaks in March at around about 134.40 uh, Canada weaken up towards there but it, I would be surprised if we went much above there because of the um, aggregation of tops in and around through March there's a decent top in the dollar CAD there's a decent bottom around 133 so I think the range trading that we're seeing in the uh, currency markets is likely to continue and I think that's 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 been a that's been a consistent problem I think for several months now is the fact that at the moment markets are trading in ranges but there is an advantage to that because if a market is trading in a range you can play the range you can sell into the tops you can buy into the dips and you can manage your stops much more effectively so in the case of the Canadian dollar here if you get a move above 134 it's, it's immediately apparent where your stop loss goes it goes above the previous highs it's manageable you can put it 20 or 30 points away with a certain degree of confidence that hopefully it won't go through that and if it does then it will probably go quite a bit higher by the same token if you get a dip back to around about 133 where you've got these lows here then you can put in a small buy order with a stop loss below the lows and then look for a rebound higher and and that's essentially you know the, the way that I like to trade the markets I wait for the market to come to me I'm not one of these people who jumps in on the back of a move higher or low simply because it'll, it can end up biting you and also it'll mean that your stop is likely to be further away than you would like it. So in terms of where we are at the moment, th those numbers aren't going to be ripping up any trees. They're not going to move. The, they're not going to cause the Fed to move one way or the other. And in fact, the softening in wages is more than likely um, going to suggest that they're probably going to um, not be moving on rates anytime soon and it could actually temper expectations about um, slowing down the reduction in their balance sheet which is due to end in September but could actually happen a little bit sooner but I think overall those numbers slightly dollar negative we'll probably see the pound go up the euro go up the dollar yen slip back. As far as equity markets are concerned, it's a bit of a Goldilocks um, report because it's not too hot and it's not too cold. So 
if we go back to the DAX, we'll probably see uh, another test through that 12,000 level, the highs that we saw yesterday, um, and um, look to edge ever so slightly higher. So this is my one hour chart. Um, we can see here that pretty much since the end of March, we've been trading steadily above this 50 hour moving average. And as long as we stay above it, then we're probably likely to continue to drift higher. However, what I wouldn't be doing ahead of the weekend is taking on too much in the way of risk because you don't really want to run anything over the weekend. 196 is better than expected. I'm being asked 180k dollar should have appreciated. Yes, it should have, but the dollar is not the headline number is good, but the wages number was disappointing. And it's the wages number, it's the inflation or the lack thereof which will drive the dollar direction. The headline number on the jobs report is probably good for the stock market. It'll push it'll push stocks up. But as far as the dollar is concerned, it's slightly disappointing because what investors are looking more closely at is what inflation is doing, what wages are doing. Wages are weaker. That is likely to depress yields. And as such, the dollar will probably weaken on the back of that. But I'm not talking we're not we're not talking, you know, we're not talking about a significant amount of weakness or strength either way. It's a Goldilocks report. It's a good report on the headline, but it's a disappointing on the wages. Therefore, what it, the dollar will continue to do, um, particularly against the euro and, and all the other G10 currencies, is it'll likely to continue to trade within its ranges. In which case, you know, if we get a drip, if we get a dip down to around about 112 on euro dollar, it'll probably rebound from there and go back higher. Um, there's there's nothing in these numbers to suggest that we're going to break out of the range that we've been in over the course of the last few weeks. So I think now um, it's probably a good idea to look ahead to what's coming up next week because those numbers, you know, they're, they're not really they're not really going to change the narrative around the direction of the dollar. We're near the top end of the range and they're not going to push it higher and break it out. So let's have a look at what's coming up next week. And I think one of the reasons why you'll find that the dollar is not making any significant moves against the euro is because next week we've got an ECB rate decision. And that comes out on Wednesday the 10th of April. Not Thursday, Wednesday for some reason. It's on a different day. Maybe it's because of the EU summit or something like that. Maybe they've decided to put it on a different day. But in any case, I think it will be particularly instructive given that the ECB at its last meeting said that it would be restarting or, or implementing a new TL, TRO program, a loan program, um, to try and stimulate demand, stimulate growth in the euro area. So, I mean, and we know, we know that the eurozone is in a manufacturing recession. We've seen it with the German PMIs. They've been abysmal, as have... French, as has some of the French data, though part of that is driven more by the fact that um, President Macron has a couple of local, a few local difficulties with uh, protesters uh, setting fire to things in Paris. What's also noteworthy is that core prices, core inflation, core CPI in the EU is at 0.8%, and that's just above an all time, it's all time low, which is 0.6%. So there is there is scope for the ECB to try and adopt extra easing policies to try and keep a lid on the euro. Uh, and that's likely to put downward pressure on it. It's still in, you know, it, it's, st it's still, um, I, I think it's still likely to have another go at that 111.80 area over the course of the next few days. What else have we got next week? Well, obviously we have the EU summit and that's likely to push the pound around quite a lot. Um, you know, the big question is what type of extension are we going to get if we're going to get one at all? I think the smart money is likely to be on the fact that the EU will grant an extension. It will probably be a year, but that remains to be seen. We've also got the latest China trade numbers, which are due out on the 12th on the Friday. Um, they were really disappointing in February, but they were likely to have been skewed by Lunar New Year. So I think we did see an improvement in the PMIs in China um, in the last set of numbers, and that could impact 
how the Aussie dollar reacts over the course of the next few days. Now, if we look at the Aussie dollar, we can see there's a big area of support all the way through the 70 level, apart from obviously this little flash crash spike that we saw at the end of last year when Apple posted that profits warning and we had some disappointing um, economic data out of China. So if we look at the 70 level on the Australian dollar and we look at this trend line through here, we could squeeze higher to around about 71.20. But if the China data for March is the trade data for March is disappointing, particularly imports as well as exports, then we could well see further weakness in the Aussie dollar. So if, as a reminder, in February, export Chinese exports declined 20 percent, which suggested that demand for Chinese product was slowing quite significantly in February. Imports were also down 5 percent, which suggested that internal demand was quite weak as well. So they'll be in, they will be very, very instructive in terms of whether or not we get a March bounce back. We also have Fed minutes also out on the Wednesday, same day as the ECB rate decision. And again, for me, I think I'll be looking for some nuance behind the real sharp change of tone in the Fed's guidance, because as I, as I, as I suggested earlier, we had an expectation that we potentially see a policy mistake from the Fed this year with potentially two or three rate rises. Now we're not pricing in any. And what I want to know is what caused Federal Reserve officials to change their guidance so sharply. Um, so those Fed minutes should be instructive when it comes to that. Furthermore, we've also got bank earnings start, US bank earnings, JP Morgan Chase first quarter earnings, Wells Fargo first quarter earnings. How has the um, inversion of the yield curve affected profitability for JP Morgan? Certainly banks have been closely watched over the course of the past uh, few months. If we look at JP Morgan Chase's long term chart here, we can see that we have we have broken to the downside, but we have recovered a little bit over the course of the past few weeks. And we can see that here, but it's a decent area of resistance all the way through 108 for JP Morgan. So disappointing numbers here could see banking stocks in the US start to roll over. So I'll be keeping an eye out for the the income numbers, the revenue numbers for JP Morgan Chase. And for Wells Fargo, I'll be looking at the mortgage lending and the overall business lending data for Wells Fargo um, first quarter earnings, which are also out on Friday. So it's a busy week towards the end of the week. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are likely to be very instructive for um, the markets at the back end of next week. So in the short to medium term, I think equity markets are likely to drift higher as we head into the weekend and we may well see um, the currency markets will just continue to range trade between the lows and the highs of the week. Does anyone else have any more questions before I wrap anything up, before I wrap all of this up? Actually, before I do, I'll have a quick look at gold because it's always a nice little favourite. Um, good support around about 12.76. We're likely to probably see a retest of that on the back of those weak wages numbers. Um, generally tends to feed into a slightly weaker dollar. There's nothing in those numbers that suggests that um, equity markets going higher. Gold generally tends to move inversely to that. And we could well see a retest of this key level here uh, around about 12.76 on gold. Looking at crude oil briefly, finding a little bit of a top around about uh, 70, 70, 71 dollars a barrel. But, but uh, crucially, we do appear to have broken above the 200 day moving average albeit very modestly. You can see it here. Let's just zoom it in. We're holding above it and have continued to hold above it for the last four days. So while we're above it, the likelihood is that we could can try it and move higher. But if we don't make a break for the upside towards $72 a barrel, we could well drift back down to 68 in the short to medium term. OK, Hang Seng. Yep, can certainly have a look at that. We don't have the China A50, but we certainly do have the Hang Seng. It was closed today. 
because of the China holiday and Hong Kong holiday. But we have broken up to the top side. Momentum looks positive. Chinese stocks in general look fairly positive, have come a long way. Um, but certainly looking at, looking at this chart, momentum is on its side. If we look at the one hour chart, as long as we hold above this 30,000 level, then I think momentum is likely to remain positive for a push, push up even higher. Again, it comes back to what I was saying earlier. You trade with the trend, the trend is higher. We're making higher lows, we're making higher highs. If we're not able to take out this series of peaks through here around about 30,100, we could see a correction back towards this, this pin low here. But you've got a nice little hammer there which suggests that there's decent demand for Hong Kong stocks in and around 29,790. So again, um, looking looking to buy the dips on the Hong Kong 50. Getting asked about the OMX. Let's see if I can find that for you. That would be... Is that the uh, Swedish OMX, Olga? Are we talking about the Swedish index? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Okay. Now that's an interesting one. We're right on the cusp of a very significant peak on the, on the OMX. Now the big question here is can it sustain this move higher? Solid support all the way through 1550. We're quite, we're quite a way away from that. I would be surprised if we move significantly above this 1630 level this week. That's not to say that we won't, but Certainly, I think in the context of the weekend, I would be a bit concerned about being long as opposed to being short at these sorts of levels. This is one of these this is one of these trades that's slightly risky because you don't want to suddenly find that as you had in the weekend, you've got a short position and it's sort of sitting on the highs and it's not really doing anything. Um, let me just add a slow stochastic to that. still potentially got momentum towards the upside there. Uh, you can ask about silver, sir. Absolutely you can. It's not too dissimilar to gold really. There's good support going through $14.80. But there's a, there does appear to be a nice little area of resistance around about $15.20 as identified by these series of peaks all the way through here. So again, as with silver, we're in a little bit of a range, so sh any any short position you'd probably put a stop loss around about 15.30, looking for a move back towards the lows around about 15 or 14.90. But again, a little bit of a range, not really doing anything particularly exciting is silver. Okay, so hopefully that's um, that's all. Um, that's all for this week. If you have any feedback on the non-farm payrolls webinar and if you found it useful, please leave a Google review. That would be absolutely enormously helpful. Uh, the more good reviews we get, the better. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you for your company this afternoon. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you all have a very great weekend and um, have a good week trading um, over the course of the next week or so. Cheers. Thanks very much.